What a Friday, huh? What a Friday. always exciting when it's Friday because <clears throat> I know exactly what I'm going to be doing all weekend. Working. Working, working, working. Working on things for you lovely people out there. Working on things that will hopefully make your lives easier, less painful. <laughs> you know, all that good stuff. All that good stuff. Hopefully, I can give you <coughs> ways to make your job easier. Like, 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 maybe not hate your job as much or something. I don't know. There's like, like little things, right? Like little things that you get out of life. Not like not hating it. <laughs> not not hating life is typically uh, an an admirable, perhaps not achievable, but admirable goal should all strive to not hate life. So, how is everyone? I assume you can hear me, since no one's complaining about not being able to hear me. And Streamlabs is at least telling me that my microphone is receiving input. But who knows? Who knows what these eyeballs have in store? Who knows what's behind these eyeballs. There we go. We have message number one. 99 to go until Twitch congratulates me on people. 99 to go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is that Chrissy here? I'm, I'm terrified now. Now I'm terrified. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. I'm going to say something incorrect about Seltzer and get yelled at. See, I've got two cans of seltzer here. If you've been to my previous streams, you know that I take seltzer very seriously. Take seltzer incredibly seriously. And this, this LaCroix seltzer right here is perhaps one of my least favorite seltzers of all time. You know why? The bubbles, big and soft. When you open it, they sound big and soft. Like, that's a big, soft opening. And when you drink it, it's barely a seltzer. It's barely a seltzer. The, the bubbles just pass over your tongue too quickly. This, Canada Dry, the official seltzer of Canada. It's much sharper bubbles. When you open it, ooh, you hear that? It's a big pop. It's a big heart. These are good, aggressive bubbles. They, they spike the tongue. They get on there. They make your tongue feel like you're drinking a seltzer. It's the big stuff. It's the good stuff. Big soft bubbles. If you like big soft bubbles, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to know more about it, I will, I will post things about the mic and headphone combo uh, when I'm done. But to me, I, I feel like I'm still a junior level with all of this, <laughs> with all the streaming stuff. Like I feel, I feel like just very entry level. Like I, I, I'm just like showing up. Like, hey, I have a green screen. Hopefully, I won't elbow it and knock it over. <laughs> it's like, like silently praying that I won't like fall backwards and let's like ruin the illusion and see my dumb posters. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead artwork. The best streamer on the whole Twitch planet. I don't know. I've I've never taken my shirt off, shown my feet, or played a video game. So I think that there are people who are light years ahead of me with streaming, who who I I think could easily topple me as in the best streaming category. We are going ASMR with soda bubbles. You're going to learn a lot about soda bubbles today. A lot. You know what? I think. What I might start doing so that I can meet in the middle with much better streamers than me is I might get the headset with cat ears so I can at least be sort of cute on stream. It could at least be like a little cute 
do like a few cute things. I could do like some paw stuff like this. And then they, maybe I would catch up. Maybe I would catch up with with other streamers who are who are much better than I am, much more talented than I am, much better setups than I am. I get I see I, what happens to me is I get weirded out cuz I watch people who stream and record streams and I think I think they have either um much more talent with video editing editing than I do or they have like a company that does it for them because they get all these like cool graphic popovers and like sound effects and like like things are like queued up properly like they'll be like if you want to see more of my content like and subscribe and like a little ding 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 bell will go off and like the button will show and you're like what how'd you do that me i'm just like eh, <laughs> there's a button somewhere on the website you're looking at press it <laughs> it's, it's okay i would like to have you back having people here gives me self-esteem <laughs> when i have eyeballs when i have eyeballs i feel better Especially on, on on a Friday, I feel better. On a Friday. All right. So uh, let's get some nonsense out of the way. Let's see. There's these other, it's still hard for me, too. I hear slobs helps with the glamour, but I haven't... Yet. So that's what I use right now. I use uh, Streamlabs OBS and... Um, I think without the help of of Drew Ferjuel, I would I would have I would have a much much crappier slob setup. Um, it there there was a bunch of weird stuff that went wrong at first. Like um, I was starting up like when when I share RD, like when I share these screens with you, they're RDPs to uh, either a VM that I have local on my laptop or a VM that's running on the desktop that I have down here and to my right. Um, so for like SQL demos and stuff, I go to the desktop so that I don't have the streaming stuff competing with the, the, the demos, right? Because some of them can get pretty intense. When I used to record videos and everything was local on my laptop, if I ran a demo that was particularly stressful on the hardware, like if I was intentionally making SQL Server boot on memory or on CPU, the video recording would start to suffer. Like my voice would go all and like the, the, the camera would get weird and like, like pixelated. So I, I realized pretty quickly that I had to like offload that stuff somewhere else. But when I first started doing it, I would do what I normally did when I sh when I did like Camtasia or something, and I would just be like, okay, well, I'm just gonna hit, R I'm just gonna type RDP down in the bottom, and the RDP window is gonna come up, and I'm gonna share that. But what got messed up was that um, slobs w couldn't detect the window when I typed in RDP. I had to type in MSTSC, and Drew helped me figure that out. Drew also helped me kind of get my act together with like the size of the canvas I was working on and like the chroma key thing and like getting things worked out. So there was just like a lot of stuff that I like, it, like were, were it not for some help from some smart kids, I never would have figured out on my own. And, but as much as I've encouraged the smart kids to <laughs> who blog more about like like things they know about streaming they 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 haven't so it might it might just be on me to to write like the the dumb kid distillation <laughs> of what the smart kids taught me how to do so like it it's yeah it's it's tough and uh, so like slobs does help with stuff but um i just i i just don't feel like i uh, like i'm i'm a super advanced user and you know like adding in the crazy pop up. Here's a thing. Like like right now, like I don't even have an like like the 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 the, the slobs um, uh, ability to like not have my arm. <laughs> like I can't figure this out. Like I just I end here. <laughs> it's just that's the end of my world. And I I wish, I wish that I could figure out how to get like myself to just sort of be big enough to reach across the screen, but without like making me so big that I cover up a lot of the screen without it. Like I just want, I want to be able to move my arm in, in bigger directions. But uh, some, some of that is like office space limitations too. Like I don't have the most amount of space right now, but hopefully, hopefully we'll see what happens. So uh, we'll get a couple silly things out of the way. Um, we are, or we, I am going to be presenting two 
uh, online classes about s performance tuning SQL Server. It's a full day of learning, uh, and it also uh, a ticket to that class will get you access to all of, all 24, 25 hours of my uh, recorded content. If you use the coupon code floating above my head there, that um, that for some reason PowerPoint has told me is is, is a typo. We'll fix that. We'll fix you, PowerPoint. Uh, if you use that, you will get 75 bucks off the face value of a ticket. And uh, I don't know. That's that. I hope to see you either on July 10th or 24th. Those are both Fridays. One of them is next Friday. And one of them is, I don't know. Is it, is it, see, if I could do this in movie style, then it would be Friday and then next Friday and then Friday after next. And I don't know if they line up quite that well. But they're both Fridays in July, so we have that to look forward to. Have that to look forward to. So let's get out of this enough 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 advertisement, as they say, and let's look at we're gonna we're gonna look at a, we're gonna look at a blog post first. The first thing we're gonna do before we write one single second of uh, a thing on the screen. We're not going to read the whole thing because if you you can tell by the size of this scroll bar over here that it, it is a long post and there's a lot. Of information in this. Well, actually, there's a lot of comments on this post. Apparently, <laughs> there's, there's more comments than post, maybe. But it is, there is, it is a fairly long post, and there are a fair bit of words in it. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to stick the link into chat so that everyone has it. If, they, if you want to read it, if you want to ignore me and read this, if you want to save it for later, either way is fine with me. I won't judge. I appreciate. I appreciate that you would come here and then click on that at all. But this is a blog post by uh, my old pal Adam Mechanic, and he wrote uh, this. In Adam, you know, spoke quite a bit. Adam was, you know, uh, quite adored and admired by the SQL Server community until he left us for Python and Postgres and whatever other things he's doing. I hear he uh, he cooks with sea urchins a lot these days. And I don't know. He's a very fancy person very fancy person but he wrote that he used to speak a lot he used to you know uh, do a lot of pre-cons sql saturdays user groups conferences all that good stuff and he was like he wrote what i thought were were very good very detailed um abstracts and intros to his pre-cons and so whenever i'm sitting down to uh to write anything new about what i'm going to teach people about i always like to go through this and just kind of you know like remind myself of a few things and I think one of the most important things is is this header right here because this is something I always mess up I try to write uh, I try to write an abstract that I would think was like cool or funny or you know that like like I would look at and be like oh yeah I'd want to show up to that and that like well that's not entirely wrong what that leads to a lot of the time is me not giving enough detail about what I'm going to be doing. I sometimes make the mistake that like people might see my name and people might see like the title of the the, the session, and people might see like sort of a, a roundup of things that like uh, things that I'd put in the abstract, but like without enough detail, without enough me saying like here's like exactly what I'm going to go through. The thing is that, like, sometimes I find that I, sometimes I find that tedious to read, and sometimes I don't know if that's what's going to grab people. So what I try to do is have a mix in there. I try to make that like first line like pop. That first line has to have like some zing to it. That first line has to be like like this is what's going to grab you and make you want to like maybe read the rest of it or at least skim enough of the rest of it to like be like yeah I'm into that, right? Like 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 you know like the like the cover of a movie. Back when movies used to have covers, you know, you'd go to like Blockbuster, be walking down the aisles, and be like looking for a movie to rent, be looking around. And I know, I know, this is going to age about as well as the, as a phone book analogy for indexes, but that's okay. It's okay. You, we, we'll work through it. We're we're grown ups. We're adults. We'll hold hands. We will make through make it through this together. But like, it has to pop. Right? It has to be interesting. Now, like, you know, if if you're scrolling through Netflix or like. Kulu or whatever service you use, and they don't sponsor me either. The only the only sponsor I'm after is Canada Dry. Canada Dry, if you're watching, <laughs> I'll work for Seltzer. <laughs> but 
so like when you're when you're like looking for something to watch, like like either like the the picture that you see or like that the first line that you that you see has to kind of grab you, right? A lot of the times with with conference speakers, you know, there's a cult of personality around them. Uh, you know, if you show up to a conference looking to learn something in particular, or you're looking at a conference website looking to learn something in particular. There's a list of names in like your mental Rolodex of what things that you work on, uh, things that you're interested in, and you know you might like see a name that matches up with that. Uh, you know whether you know it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be SQL Server. It could be anything, right? Like if you're really into HADR, you might have read like Alan Hurt stuff, and you'd be like, oh yeah, I gotta go with Alan Hurt, right? Like stuff like that. Like, like, there's a mental Rolodex of people who do that kind of work, and if you are going to a conference or a session or uh, let's just let's let's stop saying going to. Let's say attending, because going to these days is not is not a thing. If you are attending a conference or a user group or anything, mentally you would asso- you mentally associate this person with doing that thing. Like like that that's like one of the first things that grabs you. If you don't like see the if you don't see a name that grabs you immediately, then it, you might start looking at titles. So the title has to be really clear, and the title has to grab you. Once you make it past the title, well, do people really want to sit there and read 10 paragraphs of explicit detail about everything you're going to cover and learn and talk about and all like little bullet points and factoids and everything? I don't think so. I mean, I've never... I've never had it come to the point where someone was just like, you know, I'm on I'm on the fence about attending your session. <laughs> I'm this close. I just want to know if you'll cover this one specific topic that wasn't listed here. Like I've never had that. Like in you know, I think sort of generally people understand from the title and from like the zinger what you're going to get into. And so I try to like, you know, get really specific with that stuff. So, like, the title has to be specific, but it has to be catchy and memorable. And uh, the um, the first line, like, the stuff that you put uh, into the first, into, like, that first paragraph or so, the first few sentences, not even, like, a full paragraph, like, like, two to three sentences, has to, like, grab people a little bit. And it has to be something that people identify with. You know, if you are going to be teaching level 100 stuff or level 200 stuff, that's totally legit. You can totally do a full day of teaching people, you know, like how to SQL with training wheels on. I'm not against doing that. Uh, it's not typically what I aim for, but it's, you know, if, if that's if that's your jam, go for it. But sort of like generally, uh, you know, I, I aim for somewhere in the, I aim for an average of 300, but the day is going to spend time between 200 and 4, like on the 200 side and on the 400 side. I want an average of 300. I want people who maybe aren't so advanced to be able to get to 300. And I want people who um, want really advanced stuff to also be satisfied with going above the 300 mark. So, you know, you try to straddle the 300. No one's really doing 500. You can't do 500. 500 is, would be very difficult to do in an hour. 500 is still pretty tough to do in a day. Um, 500 requires so much technical background and detail that it's, it's difficult to properly humanize. And I think the average conference attendee doesn't appreciate that. You know, there are, there are a select few people who appreciate that. But if you want to really, really, like, reach out to a wide audience and get, like, like, a, like appeal to a bunch of people, saying that, like, you know, you're going to spend the day at 500, A, that's a tough mark to hit. It's tough to go eight hours at 500. <laughs> eight hours at 500 is tough. Eight hours at 400 is tough. Eight hours at 500 is, like... I, I think you would have to be David DeWitt to <laughs> spend eight hours at 500. But uh, so like, you know, try to straddle, like try to straddle things, right? Like set expectations for what we're going to do and set it appropriately. You know, uh, I, th- I think that everyone learns something at some level, re- regardless of whether it's that 200, 300, 400. 
But uh, you know, you do you do have to you do have to give people mental breaks, and you know, giving the people who show up for the four hundred level stuff uh, a mental break is good, and giving the people who show up. Um, because they need to get to 300 some like 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 totally it's like like really tough stuff to think about down the line that's also good right like challenging people is good but you don't want to lose people right so it's sort of a sort of like a it's a, it's a fine balancing act he says i had a weak course at 400 i reckon it was exhausting well yeah that sounds that does sound exhausting i think a week even a week at 200 is exhausting like i think like you know like beyond a day you're that's that's a tough one to pull off it's tough to pull off so there's there's lots of important stuff that goes into figuring out um a what you're going to say what you're going to say about it um you know you're going to have people uh you're going to have to get people in quickly. You're going to have to get people to invest quickly because they have a lot of choice, especially these days. There's a ton of choices out there for people to go uh, and, you know, get their learning from. Everything is online, and that just makes everything so much more accessible. He says, it was way over me, if I'm being honest. I was good for two days, really. Yeah, so, you know, there's... um. <sighs> If, if it's constant 400 after, I think you're right, at probably after two days, uh, the, the glamour wears off and you're just like constantly bludgeoned by despairing facts and crazy niche stuff that you might have to do and be aware of and learn in these very specific scenarios. But... Uh, the other, I th so like that brings up something because I think I think another really big problem with constant four hundred level stuff, or I mean forget five hundred level stuff. Anyone who says they're presenting at five hundred, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Like that, I think that like like you would have to really carefully qualify someone talking about something at a five hundred level. Like it couldn't just be someone who like just uses it. I think you would have to be talking to someone who like was part of the design or development team of a product or feature in order to get 500. Um, but I think a lot of the, the problem, or the, well, not say the problem, a lot of the difficulty with a constant stream of 400 is you're just playing SQL Jeopardy. You're listing off facts all day. You're listing off stuff that might, might never apply to people. You're listing off stuff that, you know, like you might have seen once in 20 years of working with whatever technology you're talking about and you feel compelled to tell someone about it because just maybe just maybe it'll it'll help them one day but you know that's what when you start that's 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 when like the the checklist stuff comes in and the sequel Je or like the you know i guess this the the subject jeopardy stuff kicks in it just gets really tough to stay at that like get like get at that level and stay at that level that's a it's a tough one so there's stuff in here that's very good to consider when you're writing an abstract right appealing to your audience figuring out who they are i start a lot of my abstracts with saying you know you're a dba or developer who's been working with sql server for x number of years um you know identifying the crowd be like oh yeah that's me uh, you know you have tough performance tuning problems like xyz and xyz can be you know xyz doesn't have to be terribly specific like xy doesn't have to be like uh and you have a lot of problems with <laughs> with uh like paging queries or you have a lot of problems with like i don't know whatever else right like I, you don't know how to read execution like, like there's a lot of like just like like overly specific stuff that you can put in there but you need to be able like you, like this is like for me some of that stuff is uh like what goes later on like when we get into detail when i'm trying to figure out what problems you need to solve i'm like you have a tough time like figuring out where to start you have a you don't you don't know where the problem is like you know you have performance problems but where are they is it the queries the indexes is it like you know is it like the way your tables are designed are your server settings terrible is your hardware like underpowered like 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 where do you start right like people who are just looking at a sql server and like 
maybe open activity monitor or like run SPU or SPU2. And is it just like, uh, <laughs> I I don't know what happened. Because SQL Server is tough like that. SQL Server does not make it terribly easy. Does not make it terribly easy to figure out what happened. They make it very easy to see, sort of. They make it easy to see what's happening. There's a lot of stuff you can capture hitting F5, but, you know, if if something was wrong, you know, at the rate that users report it, you know, last Thursday or two hours ago or something, there just might not be a lot you can figure out or do with that. So, you know, uh, a lot of people do have problems. Um, a lot of people do have problems with figuring out um, you know, just where to begin with SQL Server troubleshooting. Like, and you know, it's it's my job as a presenter to fig to tell them which place I'm going to get them to. Right? Uh, Carmen says, uh, "Can you please suggest database migration checklist?" Uh, no, that's not the kind of thing that I do. But if you really want something good to help you with that. Give me one second to bring up the commands over here. Da -da -da. Migration. Here we go. If you want something to make that easy, there you go. But uh, just to make it perfectly clear, uh, this is uh, uh, that is not something that I do, and that's not something that I have. And um, if if you have more detailed questions about it, I have. I cannot. I will not have more detailed answers. If I had to do it, that's what I would do. <laughs> I would. I would. <laughs> <laughs> grab the script. I would hit, it's not F5 in PowerShell. In PowerShell, it's F8. I would grab that script, I would hit F8, and I would, I would sit back and let PowerShell do the rest. I'm not smart enough to have written it, but I'm smart enough to use things that smart people write. Because that's, that's basically what the world is, is, is learning something. It's like being lucky enough to have smart people <laughs> around you do things, and you just say, oh, they can make my life easier. So let's see. Uh, when we're when we're trying to figure out who we want to talk to, how we want to talk to them, right? And we and, and we want to make sure that we do it in a way where you know uh, someone who might be like nervous or um, just sort of like unsure where they fall into the world. Well, I mean, you have you, you have to be careful with the way that you phrase things and the way you the way you word things, right? Because you you want you really do want everybody to be in there like you don't you don't want to say like oh like you know you're you're a you know beginner it guy or something like that right you just don't like you know, leave that kind of stuff out so what we need to do is figure out who we want to talk to what we want to talk to them about and then we can come up with the catchy stuff we need we need to know we need to identify a few things first before we go and um, before we go and even start writing a single thing. He says, must be utterly nerve-wracking doing, uh, presenting a session. Eh, it's, no, it, like, the, the presenting part doesn't really um, make me nervous anymore. Uh, streaming makes me nervous because I am just not confident in the technology enough. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm relieved and I find it to be quite miraculous that I could download a few things, hit a few buttons, and show up on a screen in close to real time <laughs> in front of people. I am amazed by that. But, like, it still makes me nervous. <laughs> it still makes me very nervous. I don't like it. Like, not that I think it's bad thing. No, it's just, it's, it's nerve-wracking. Like, just think, like, waiting for something to go wrong, right? Like, waiting for audio to cut out, waiting for video to cut out, waiting for, like, my internet to fall apart, waiting for, like, one of, like, the receiving servers to just fall apart. Like, just all this stuff that, like, could go wrong <laughs> when you're on screen. You're just like, oh, please don't fail. Like, like and it's not because I'm, like, em I would be embarrassed for me. It's because, like, I don't want... I don't want anyone who watches me to have a bad experience watching me. It's tough enough watching me without technical difficulties. <laughs> so, yeah, so Adam brings up a good point here. And this is kind of the point that I was starting to make. <clears throat> uh, is people can't be, some people can't be bothered to read big, full paragraphs 
of words. He says, I like the lack of pretzel. So I, I tried pretzel for a minute. Uh, I downloaded it, and I started listening through the music. Uh, the EDM category was deeply, deeply offensive. Deeply offensive. Um, <clears throat> but even more offensive was the hip-hop category. If you ever want to be deeply offended, if you, if you like hip-hop at all, and you want to be deeply offended, um, look at, like, listen to the music in the hip-hop category on Pretzel. You will be so angry. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, read in 2020. Let's see. Uh, I know that's in here somewhere. Yes. Read in 2020. Uh, is, there a, is there a reference to 2020 in here? I thought there was. So yeah, so let's uh, let's let's back out of this blog post because I think we've spent enough time in the blog post. All right, there's there's enough in here, and there's enough for you to go over later on your own. So let's talk a little bit about what we could present about because usually, you know, the thing that I get into, and that font is just terribly small. I don't know why. I don't know why you're messing with me. PowerPoint's messing with me all the time. Let's make that a nice size font. 28 sounds good to me. Let's see, because what I usually talk about is performance. What I don't talk about, things that I'm not particularly good at, is HA, no DR, no security, hell no. Not my jams. PowerShell, I've tried. It was not, I, I found myself sadly wanting in all things PowerShell. Uh, couldn't hack it. I was not good, I was not, sm I was not good enough, I was not smart enough. <laughs> and and power, me and PowerShell did not get along. What would always happen is, uh, you know, I would, and, and like, I, what I would, I, I would have something to do. And I would think, this is what people use PowerShell for. This is what people use it for. And I would spend some time like searching around for the right commands to run and I would like try some stuff out. And then like, you know, I would start getting closer and closer and then like three, four hours later, it would just be like me weeping over the keyboard because I couldn't get anything to work. It was just, I, T-SQL has so infested my brain <laughs> that that is like, that is just where I have to go and where I have to stay whenever. <laughs> Things get whenever things go outside of that, I fall to pieces. This is like if I'm not performance tuning something, I'm like I don't I don't know what it does. <laughs> like, like poking it, just like what are you? I don't understand it. So uh, we should we should at least get this to mal match up, right? Heck yeah. So I do performance stuff. Uh, yeah. So it's just it it's it's funny how like s like someone can be, you know, very, very good at one thing technically, or even intellectually, or, you know, and just like, you know, be able to just like very quickly, deeply, like understand and grasp things, and then look at something else that's like uh, equally, and you're just like, don't know, <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> like, like riding a bike, just like, ah, pedals, like you could be an F1 driver, like, and like be able to speed around tracks at like close to 200 miles an hour and handle things perfectly, and then like, like you know, look at look at a, look at a bicycle and be like, ah, what is this? <laughs> what is this? I don't I don't know, I don't know. It it goes too slow for me to figure it out. <laughs> so we have performance, which I'm into. HA is out, DR is out, security is out, PowerShell is out. But we still have some things within performance, right? Within performance. We have some choices. Do we want to talk about server tuning, which would be weight stats, hardware, settings, etc.? Do we want to talk about index tuning? And if we're going to talk about index tuning, what are we going to talk about within index tuning? We have to set some expectations here because there's a lot of different kinds of indexes within SQL Server. Not all of them are typically well used, and they're probably not things that people would expect you to cover. But you have to, you know, if like I think, you know, you don't need to say uh, no XML spatial or in memory. 
Like, you, you probably don't have to go so far as to say that stuff. But you should probably spe specify, are you going to cover a column store? Are you only going to cover row store? Like, what, what are you going to cover within these things? Now, I, I, love, I love column store. But I do not have the chops with column store to spend a full day talking about it. The internet is full of blog posts about column store that are just sort of rundowns of the documentation. You can kind of tell that someone flipped on their laptop, um, you know, had like one of the smaller Microsoft databases, ran a few scripts, and they were just like, cool, here's a blog post. You, they're missing that sort of deep understanding of column store, the things you can run into it, like the actual like production usage of it. Like my friend Joe Obish, he uses Column Store like a champ. He but he has been through serious, serious pain learning it. Without that pain, some of that some of that learning just isn't there. And you kind of get this like you know that Shady Acres pamphlet, like just send your data to Column Store. It'll be it'll chase rabbits all day. There will be other data just like it. It'll have friends without like any of like the real deep understanding of just like, oh damn, don't do that. <laughs> like, oh, dude, just, just just stay. If you're doing that, run screaming. <laughs> like bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. You know you get like you get like the glossy pamphlet. You don't get you don't get the full story. You, there's a lot of errors and omissions when people have not used something deeply in production. And <clears throat> so as much as I love column store, I am not qualified to talk about column store. I have never done any big, uh, you know, column store migrations. I've never done any big column store tuning projects. I've done regular query tuning and I've, you know, figured out when people would be better off with column store and I've helped them, you know, move some stuff into there, but I just haven't run into like like the bevy of problems that, you know, you would if you were regularly working with column store with ETL stuff like that. So, <clears throat> we're going to not do column store. If we're going to do column store, I am going to stick generally to row store indexes because that's where that's where my knowledge is. I just don't know column store well enough to answer to like stand there and answer questions about it. So, if I'm going to do server tuning, <sighs> this is an interesting one. This is an interesting one. Because it feels to me like the more you talk about weight stats, the less people want to use weight stats. <clears throat> weight stats have very real flaws in them, particularly the way SQL Server logs them, where they're just sort of aggregated since the server started up. You can have very, very unreliable data there. It's, they're somewhat helpful to uh, identify big bottlenecks, big problems, big problems. Right? If you see just like crazy weights on something, it can be helpful there. But it doesn't but like you can miss a lot of the picture, right? If you have a bursty workload that's only busy some parts of the day and does really nothing else from like you know for hours at a time, it, weight stats become less useful. So if you're going to teach people about weight stats, you have to give them a way to m gather weight stats in a way that makes them more useful for them. Not many people have that t constant 24-7 pounding workload on a server. And even if they do, that workload isn't typically all user-facing, right? Even those servers will have some sort of night maintenance, you know, code rollout, change management, you know, whatever they're doing, taking backups, running CheckDB, index maintenance, stats maintenance, whatever it is they're doing, there's typically some maintenance window for that. Very few people have the like 24-7 need to just constantly be running queries. So, or user-facing queries, I should say. So, weights, if you're going to do wait stats, you really do need to give people a way to gather weight stats in a way that they can make sense of their workload. There's all sorts of stuff about weight stats that sure you can hit F5 and you can get sums and averages and percentages, but a lot of the stuff that you can just hit F5 on, you also don't get 
like like how long the server has been up so you can kind of compare things to that because a really important metric when you're looking at wait stats is like compared to what like the famous economist question right compared to what like how are you doing today compared to what i don't know <laughs> like can compared to someone who is staring at an iv in the hospital probably pretty good compared to someone who's sitting on a yacht in like the south of like off the south of europe you know doing something fantastic with themselves probably not as good right compared to what so if you're going to give someone stuff about weight stats you need to give them a lot like a lot to like make sure that they know what to compare it to how to gather stuff how to read stuff what weight stats mean what weight stats are problems and that's a tough gig because most of the time when you start writing stuff like this you start thinking well Maybe you should just get a monitoring tool. And then you think, maybe I should write a monitoring tool. And you think, uh, oh, that sounds hard. I should just go work for a monitoring tool. And then you think, uh, oh, I don't really want a real job. And so wait, so I, I, I tend to stay away from this stuff now. The thing about hardware too is that with a lot of workloads being virtualized or in the cloud, stuff that you can say with confidence about physical hardware changes quite drastically when it comes to virtualized hardware. You know, there's stuff you could say about like SOS scheduler yield, CX packet, you know, page IO latch, all that stuff that, you know, on bare metal hardware, you would you would be right. Virtual hardware, you would have a lot more to dig into. So if you're going to start talking about hardware, you kind of have to know a lot about not just like the CPU and the memory, but now you have to start understanding virtualization layers, how VMs talk to the virtualization layer, how things might look if you have a lot of VMs on, on like a lot of VM guests on one host, all sort of making crazy requests, asking for resources in different ways. Like maybe you have an over, like, like what used to be a concept like, oh, your CPU, like your, your SQL server hardware is just underpowered. Could be, well, you gave SQL to so the SQL server VM enough hardware. The problem is it has to share that hardware with like 30 other SQL server VMs on the same host. Because Everyone who virtualizes is a cheapskate, and they, they 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 license enterprise at the host level, and they're like, "Cool, so everything gets enterprise and goes here." <laughs> and that's like 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 that's like the, like the new kids on the block version of like just stacking a bunch of SQL instances on the same server. So you, like, if you're gonna do hardware, you really have to understand like virtualization. You really have to understand stand VMware, all the little intric intricacies of things that can go on in there with like settings and you know how you like can like have VMs allocated and like where they go and uh, you know like crazy stuff too. Like just like 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 how like what a big difference like para virtual SCSI connections can make over other things. And then like you have to st like you know like the stuff you have to get into with hardware can be pretty challenging forget all the stuff you might need to know about the cloud and cloud instances that'll be wrong in three months. So hardware is kind of get turning into a tougher and tougher subject to teach. I used to really like talking about hardware because there was like some like f like cool stuff that you could show people like like if you have a bunch of queries run and run out of worker threads or when you hit resource semaphore because you run out of query, like memory to grant out to queries or when like your server just pl plum doesn't have enough memory and you spend most of your time waiting on page IO latch or whatever it is. But you know like and, and like well the, I still I enjoy that stuff from teaching people about it from a performance perspective you know, you get to the point where you're like, okay, so like, wait, there's a fix for that in the cloud, like to just move to a bigger instance size. Cause like, there's no longer that challenge of like, oh, we got to shut order the memory, shut the server down, install the memory, turn the server back on, wait three days for post to test the memory, stuff like that. It's just like, it, it becomes a lot easier to just say, well, flip a button and see if it goes away or flip a button and see if it minimizes some, right? So like, when I teach people about those weight stats now, it has to be in the context of, well, how can we tune the query or the, like the queries or the indexes in order to make better use of the hardware so that we are not pounding SQL Server out the way that we used to. And then, you know, settings, golly and gosh. I, I can't imagine someone sitting through a full day of how to set max stopping cost threshold. So the server tuning stuff, I kind of get away from a little bit. So within performance, we, we're, we can talk about, you know, index tuning, and we can talk mostly about 
row store indexes. So that's one possibility. There's also query tuning, right? And query tuning, but you know, query tuning should go hand in hand with index tuning. Um, I, I would say there are certain query writing patterns that should certainly be taught and addressed. But if we're going to talk about how to tune a query, you can't just leave out how to tune, how to tune indexes. You can't, tune, you can't just leave out how to identify if your index key columns are in the wrong order, if you should fix a key lookup, if you should fix a sort, if you're getting the right type of join or the wrong type of join because of the way your indexes are like designed. There's just like so much that you need to fig like, like think about figure out like like when it when it comes to that stuff the query and index tuning kind of go hand in hand uh there's a couple of things over in chat i've been watching your video from 11 days ago for the past 30 minutes and realized i wasn't live ha 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 well now you'll be able to tell because i'm much hairier uh we have olap queries in the weekend which screw up all the weight stats see that's another thing you, you can like that's another terrible thing about weight stats is like you can't filter them out based on when they happen and unless you're on SQL Server 2017 and you have Query Store turned on, it's very difficult to figure out which queries are responsible for which weights. Like, like what, like what happened to you? Like, what caused you? Oh, like, you know, like that makes a big difference too, right? Like, if you had some like big OLAP query come along and cause a bunch of like thread pool or resource semaphore weights, you might look at weight stats overall for the server and be like, "Holy smokes, what happened to you?" But <laughs> <laughs> then, like you look at the, like the regular user workload, and you're like, eh, none of none of that's happening then. Right? So it's just like, come on, Microsoft, give me something, give me something, throw me some bone. So within performance, query tuning and index tuning should go hand in hand. Uh, and. I think it's very important with indexes specifically to not to make sure that people understand you're not going to sit there and teach them what it what, what a B tree is because that doesn't help them. You don't want to like like what's on an index like here's 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 an hour of DBCC page demos. Like it's just stuff has to be practical too. Right? Like if you just sit there and do a full day of like this crazy trick that no one's ever, no one's gonna walk out of there and ever see in their life. They're just gonna be befuddled as as to what happened. Like, what did I do? What did I just learn? If I see this this one very specific set of circumstances that this consultant up on stage saw once in his 25 years of working with computers, well, eh. But it's so great to teach people about I/O complexity. Yeah, when they're really interested in I.O. complexity and they're geared up to learn about I.O. complexity, that's a great thing. If you have a bunch of accidental DBAs in a room who are just like, do I have I.O. complexity? Is my I.O. complex? Do they really need to learn about how complex I.O. is or do they need to learn how to find their problems and fix them? Right? It's like... If you have people who are like, yeah, teach me about, like, I'm a sand admin, teach me about the I.O. complexity, or like, you know, like, it's just someone who has an interest in it because they're, like, they're down with it, then, like, what? Yeah, great. I.O. complexity, uh, in general, not going to solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. It's just not. A lot of people are not going to look at I.O. complexity and be like, oh, now I know why that query's slow. So query and index tuning should go hand in hand, but it has to be practical things they can use when they leave. All right? We can't we can't just teach crazy stuff all day long. So we have query and index tuning. We have we have that. But there's a lot of query and index tuning stuff out there. Do we want to specify it? Do we want to say something like for OLTP? for uh, uh, OLAP. Like, do we want to spe specialize? I don't know. I don't know. Within query performance, there's other stuff too, right? Like, if we're going to query an index tune, what if it's not just the query? What if there's blocking? 
Do we need do we need to cover blocking? Is do we consider blocking to be a performance problem? Is blocking a performance problem or a concurrency problem? That's something else we need to figure out, right? Like 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 where do we want to go with this thing? Where, like which areas do we want to cover within performance? There's a ton of different things that you can look at. So, what do you think? What do you think out there? There are there are there are people who have been in here listening to me, listening to me talk, and listening to me talk about like you know like performance tuning subjects, and not just today, like you know over the past like couple weeks or so that I've, I've I've been streaming. What what things do you find yourself wanting to know more about? What what things do you find yourself having trouble with? He says, one thing I have found a gap in with a lot of things I have attended. It's rarely looking at queries the size of the ones you see in real life. Presenter needs to get to the point across, but it's a different world. Yep. So, uh, and I run into that too. So here's the thing: if if I may, if I spent the time to make every single query big and complicated, and I sh and and I showed it to you, there's a lot that you would get distracted by. You would be looking at the query, trying to figure out what it does. You'd be looking for mistakes. You'd be trying to find this, that, or the other thing. What presenters need to do is come up with the simplest way to describe a concept, to describe an anti-pattern to look for, to give you something to look for in those big queries and in those big plans that you can single out and try to fix. It's not always like, you know, the most germane thing in the world to try to, uh, you know, write a gigantic query that has this one problem in it and focus in on that. Sometimes you have to say, look, here's the problem you'll see. It could be part, it could be a small part of a big picture, but here's the small problem and here's how to fix it. Let's see. Coyote McD says, does a precon have to be super practical? What about a precon for nerds who just want to learn how things work? Sure, but that's a very, very limited audience. If I'm going to do a precon, I want to appeal to a wide, or to a wide range of people who need who need help, right? The nerds who want to know how things work are, I mean, what one in like like the people who are really like ready for that, interested in that, and need that. There's a much, much smaller crowd than I would aim for. I want to be able to teach. I want to be able to teach as many people at one time as I can. So for me, it does have to be practical. And, you know, um, it's funny, it's funny the way you worded that because a pre like a precon for nerds who want to know, learn how things work sounds pretty practical to me, but I get what you, I, I think I see what you're getting at with like, you want the deep internal stuff. You want, you want that next level in that isn't common knowledge. And like I was saying before, to get that sort of thing, that's where you need, that's where, I mean, say like that is where you need a Bob Ward type person who has that, who has access to the, like th who can see the source code, who can see the private symbols, who is, you know, whip crack with Windabug and can, who can like give that deeper um, internals knowledge and, you know, do pretty well with it. Cause people would want to learn that from Bob. There are very few people who a people would want to learn that from. And there are very few people who I think are ready to and who would fully grasp whatever they're teaching. So what you said is actually a very practical thing. A person who just wants to learn how things work, right? They just want to, just want to know how to solve a problem, learning how something works so they can fix it. Lee says, I guess it's a fine line between hobby and work. Hobbyists want to get deeper. The next guy I want, yeah, exactly. And, and you, have to, you have to be able to respect both crowds, right? And there's also, there's also a funny question in there is it's, does the hobbyist show up to a day-long pre-con to learn? Does a hobbyist get the, uh, you know, their work to pay for a pre-con like, for them to attend, show up, hang out? learn stuff for a full day. Does the hobbyist show up for that full day training? The hobbyist might show up to a conference to get some time off work, to get some free travel, show up to a couple few sessions where the title attracts them, but I don't know if the hobbyist is going for that full day. Getting the hobbyist into the full if you can, if you find a way to get the hobbyist into a full day, you have cracked a very, very unique market. That is, that is a very, that is a tough, 
tough nut to crack. Mostly you, mostly you need the people who, you know, um, either, you know, they are the hobbyist, uh, or rather like, yeah, they're the hobbyist who wants more, who like, you know, craves more, or, you know, they might be, uh, you know, the, uh, people who, um, you know, who just want to like learn how to solve a problem, but their boss is just sick of them being that person. They're like, look, we have real problems that you want to solve. Here's an extra 400 bucks. You're going to go to this day. You're going to learn some stuff. Maybe it'll help. Right. Uh, look at all the crowd that you have. Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes it's better than others. (laughs) Sometimes it's better than others. This isn't, this isn't a particularly riveting SQL server topic. So I don't know. I didn't expect a big crowd today. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm happy for anyone who shows up and, and ever at all. Um, but, you know, if, 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 I, if I'm doing something where I'm actually talking about like real SQL server stuff, then you usually have a few more people. And this is this is like a weird soft skill one. So I, I don't expect a lot of people in here who aren't just like drunk, bored <laughs> in Europe after work, <laughs> something like that. So, you know, I, 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 have, I have different expectations for this one. different expectations but we're having fun anyway and we're going to write this thing anyway so we figured out a few things we were we're obviously going to talk about performance but where do we want to go with performance i do a lot of uh performance tuning training that ends up hitting pretty advanced stuff and i think well i think two things at the same time sometimes that's it's difficult but I think two things at the same time. One is that um, there is probably a market out there for people who are beginners who want to start being advanced. And then there are also people who think they're way more advanced than they are. They're the people who always have a what about, but what if, but it's never about anything particularly pertinent or the, anything that would really work. So there's, there's two crowds out there. If I'm going to focus on a crowd right now, as far as material goes, I think I want this crowd a little bit. I want people who realize that they don't know what they don't know, who... Um, who are having real troubles performance tuning, they might read blogs, they might, you know, watch videos, they might, you know, um, they might go to user groups and stuff, but they're just not making that jump. They're not making the, like, the right connection to figure, to, like, get themselves on the path to advanced. So I want to, I want to start, I want to start, I think I would like to, for this one, attract people who need to go, maybe not from, like, two or 300 to 400, but maybe from like one or 200 to 300. I don't want to have to get crazy deep into stuff. I just want to give people, I want to give people enough so that when they start looking at code and indexes and query plans, they can start like, like thinking for themselves, learning for themselves and fixing problems themselves. He says, I don't think he wants to see us. That's not true at all. I would love to see faces. Like maybe not in this format, but if uh, if if if, we, if you know we were live and in person, and I was looking out at you while I was doing this, I would be very very happy to see see those faces. So it's not like I don't want to see you. I just don't think this is a great format to see you in. Like if I had like a Brady Bunch style like lineup of faces off to the side, I don't I don't know that that would be helpful. The <laughs> CPU bunch of you would say like. Mm-hmm. connection timing out and whatnot. So what could we call, what could we call a precon? What is our title going to be? Where we try to, we try to attract people who need to go from like one, 200 to 300. Like what's some good stuff in there? What's some good stuff that we could call it? I'll give, I'll give y'all some time to think. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give it a few. Let's see, maybe uh, the, Beginner's Guide to Advanced Performance Tuning. That might be a good one. 
Uh, man, you're failing me miserably. <laughs> no and no. Uh, damn, Arthur. Putting me up, put me on blast like that. Put me on blast. The video freeze for anyone else. I don't know, but I'll stop and wait for someone else to answer. Maybe try refreshing, Arthur. Did the audio also freeze, or can you still hear me? Uh oh, Arthur. Might want to check that internet, pal. <laughs> so maybe the beginner's guide. Why are you blue? Oh, because you're. No, oh, screw. I'm not changing that. Beginner's guide to advanced performance. Doing that might run. Uh, starting. SQL. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Uh, what would be a good way to uh, starting single? Maybe starting isn't that great of a. Maybe isn't that isn't. Had to reboot. Like your whole computer? I've been playing too many video games, man. It's got, you know, all that precious VRAM. <laughs> all that precious VRAM is sucked up. Like video games. SQL Server taking the next step from beginners to advance. Okay, that's got something to it. All right. But I don't know if I necessarily want SQL Server in front of that. Maybe I could do... You know what? Maybe we could, we could combine forces a little bit here. Maybe we could call it... Oh, and look at that pasting with full formatting. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you probably <coughs> the most invaluable piece of advice that I have. When it, when you have text that is formatted in a certain way, like when I paste that text there, it comes up with a background and different fonts and everything. If you click on the Windows icon, oh, it's not in here. If you click on the search icon and you paste something in there, and then you copy and paste it out you get rid of all the formatting. But we're going to have to fix these words a little bit. Next step from beginner to advanced. There we go. Using notepad for that. See, there you go. There's all see there's all sorts of fun tricks out there. I don't trust word he says paste values in Word, I don't trust that. Every time I paste values in Word, you know what happens? It changes fonts on me. Like, I'll hit enter a couple times and a font will switch to something else. It's never a good experience. I don't tr unless I can, unless I have the raw values from somewhere else, I just don't trust Word to do anything right. Like, like you ever try to, like, get Word to, like, 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 go, like, you scroll down and then you're like, oh, I want to put something here. And you're like, hello. And then you like write some stuff up here and you hit this. And then like this just jumps down. And then you like spend some time trying to get this to work. And it's just like it just jumps up and down in like weird increments on you. Like I just don't trust Word to do anything right. I just don't. I just don't ever do it. So let's call this title. So we have two now. We have the beginner's guide to advancing. And we have this one. Oops, come on. Come on. All right. So, what else do we have in here? What's what else could we do? Will be I'll give I'll give I'll give one more lucky lucky person a chance. Come up with a title. Advanced performance tuning, starting sequel, taking the next step from beginner to advanced. But this, see the problem with this one is um it's, we need we need we need we needed people to know uh, that it's about performance tuning. If we don't know that it's about performance tuning, people will say, "Beginner to advanced, what?" <coughs> what you should know about performance tuning. I don't know about that one. It needs to be it needs to more be more action packed, right? It needs to be more action packed. It's a bit nebulous. We need we need something that we need something that signifies someone is someone is someone is starting from the beginner area. Right? Someone is on the path to advance, but they haven't quite made it there yet, right? 
So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that and we'll think. So we have the title. So we have the titles down. So who? <laughs> Performance tuning, find where it hurts and fix it. Ooh, I, I like it and I would use that for something else. But you know what? I, but I, 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 what I, what I need to, or what I would need to do with that, is I would need to, um, I would need to figure out how to get. Oops. I would need to figure out how to get it to also include the fact that, uh, you know, this is a beginner level class. That this is not going to be, you know, three and f like you know, four hundred level stuff. And I would need. So I would need like that, that sort of thing in it. We'll get some, get some capitalization in here. So who, who are we talking to? In this case, we don't necessarily want uh, DBAs because uh, oftentimes, so actually, you know what? Let's not do it by title. What we don't want, this is not about infrastructure issues like backups, hardware, HADR, right? So accidental DBAs is, is okay. I'm okay from, I'm okay with uh, accidental DBAs. I'm also okay with software developers, but what I don't want is infrastructure DBAs. I don't want a junior DBA who is consumed by you know taking backups restores check db not because they don't want them to learn about performance tuning but that's just not where they're focused right now that's not where the, like that's not what they're showing up to a class to learn i don't want people to think i'm going to teach you how to take backups faster right and i don't want people to learn like like you know how to you know how to you know get your availability group to fail over faster <coughs> so like i don't want the infrastructure dba I want the D I want DBAs who are doing performance tuning. So let's 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 focus in a little bit about that on that. You've been performance tuning SQL Server for uh for, let's see for a year or two. So a year or two is probably good um, because that would at least get people in the door who have you know looked at a query, query plan, have looked at indexes, have probably fixed some problems on their own, and who are pro who have probably gotten to the point where they've hit a problem where they had to go read something, right? So like they're not totally unfamiliar with things. They just might not have the depth of knowledge on certain things that gets them to the advanced part. To the advanced part. Uh, so let's say you've been, re you've been performance, like uh, we want people, let's, let's not write the abstract in the who. People who have been performance tuning for one to two years. Probably read blogs, watch videos, and are familiar enough with SSMS. Oops. <laughs> uh, query plans. Oops. Someday I'll get it right. Query plans, uh, indexes to not need... Um, <clears throat> let's see. Well, let's figure out a different way to say it. Um, let's say to not know, like, so, like, we, like, we, what I want to identify is, you know, people who, um, people who know what these things are and where to find them. Like, I don't want someone who's just like, but what script should I run to look at my indexes? Like, I want someone who's a little bit more engaged in that. Uh, and how to. Find them. That's good enough wording for now. So let's see here. Uh, Lee says it's the glue that links different concepts together to provide a solution. That's the hard part. Yeah. So you know, um, <clears throat> whenever you're tuning a query, you know there, you know there could be any number of things that look pathologically wrong with it. You know, it could be something in the query plan with the parameters, the way the query is written. But getting like to the end result of what was actually slowing it down, it could have only been one or two of like the five or six things that you spotted, right? Like it could be, it could be like you were just like, oh, oh, it could be that, oh, it could be that. But then like you know, you go hit a five, you look at the actual plan, you're like, oh, that's what it. That's that one thing. It wasn't the five or six other things that will probably go wrong next. 
<laughs> it's that one thing that was wrong now. So, so we want people who have not been doing this for a very long time, but who at least have the wherewithal to know some stuff up front, right? Like, I don't want anyone to ask me, like, how do I get an execution plan? You know, how is query formed? Uh, what's the difference between a clustered and a non-clustered index? I want people who have like some meat on their bones, but I don't want people who are like up on stage flexing. Right? I want like people who have just like kind of got a little bit out of it. So, <clears throat> and I want to know what's their pain. Do they need to? Are they? Do they have a tough time reading query plans? Um, understanding what's wrong with way uh query ha 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 queries written oh man i boffed that one huh um <clears throat> designing indexes um like what 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 pain points do they have what are they what are they currently just struggling with so think back to when you were like a year or two into performance tuning what kind of stuff <clears throat> um what kind of stuff were you just befuddled by Okay, identifying the real body bottleneck. Okay, uh, I find it difficult to find out what I should expect as performances for a query. Parallel, <laughs> Coyote McD. A lot of people are still befuddled, flummoxed, and perplexed by parallelism, as we have recently learned. <laughs> if we actually, you know, let's go find it. Let's go see where things are at. So, um, my dear friend, Paul White, has has the Twitter poll has a Twitter poll. And if I go search through here a little bit, I will find the Twitter poll. <laughs> it's in here somewhere. There we go. So if you're on Twitter, I highly suggest that in the next three hours or so, you go and answer this poll. The poll is a, it's a good question. Some replies were hidden by the tweet offer. <laughs> good for you. So the answer, or rather the question posed by Mr. White, for scientific purposes. A row mode parallel query runs at max stop four on a SQL server 2005 to 2019 instance with eight total cores. What is the maximum number of threads that can be running concurrently for the query? Notice we're not saying schedulers or cores. We're not saying CPU. The maximum number of threads that can be running concurrently for the query. <clears throat> oh, Michael, I'm not going to say if you're if you're right, wrong, or anywhere in between. I am going to say that you are a very, very smart person. And that if more people listen to you, more people would would be smarter too. Lee says resource usage versus query speed. Uh, I know that you didn't say cost, um, but you know resource usage is interesting because what if so? Here's here's an example. What if you have a query that uses one second of CPU uh, and runs serially? So that, that every time that query runs, it takes one second. Now let's say you have you tune that query and it goes parallel. It now runs at dot four. So it now uses four seconds of CPU, but it runs for 250 milliseconds. In this case, we had perfect parallelism. Everything teamed up. Gene Omdahl stretched out in his grave, put his arms up and screamed, we did it. I'm not sure if Gene Omdahl is dead. It just had a good visual to me there. <laughs> Zombie Gene Omdahl, like, we did it. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're not dead, Gene. I apologize. So you used four times the amount of CPU to get the query to be four times as fast. You used, you used more resources, but the end user gets the result faster. Did you tune the query or not? Did you do better? Is the query better? Can you is there is there a is there a serial plan for that query that would be two hundred and fifty milliseconds? This is these see when it comes to resource usage, it's a tough thing to gauge whether resource usage has made a query better or worse. The same thing goes for reads too. 
Same thing goes for reads. Same thing goes for reads. You can, you can, I have tuned queries, I swear to you, where I have ended up doing more reads, but the query has been much, much faster. It's a, it's a real thing. Khalil says, depends on the query and how many branch. Well, go vote. You have the link is in chat. You can go vote. You can you can tell Paul what you think about his question. So that's interesting, though. So we have some things, some things in here we have to add. So we had some stuff <coughs> identifying bottlenecks, parallelism resource usage by queries. Uh, let's see. So what else? What other, what other pain points might people be struggling with in their first year or two of query tuning? Maybe when well, we have designing indexes, let's just let's add what's a good, what's a good index. Um, <laughs> Making CTEs faster, that's a good one. Parameterization, Arthur, holy smokes. And is that, is that, so, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a tough question because you're a smart person, Arthur. How would you teach uh, beginner people about parameterization? Like, like, what would be your end goal? Michael says when there are too many indexes. Too many indexes. That's a good one too, because too many indexes can really, really cause things to barf up in the wrong way, and they really cause things to go down the wrong pipe. So having too many indexes is probably a good thing to identify. I'm, I'd, I'd be with you on that. I'd be with you on that. Three most common: ad hoc, prepared, and prox. There we go. And prox. And so when you teach them about parameterization, do you also go into force parameterization? <coughs> uh, do you go into oops, that didn't do that didn't go well. Let's let's scoot that over a second. Parameter sniffing, things like that. Maybe dynamic SQL. Ooh la la, I love the sound of that. So, what about dynamic SQL? What about dynamic SQL would you, would you, would you want, you, you have wanted your past just starting out with SQL Server stuff to learn? Would it be, um, you know, staying safe by, uh, staying safe, no SQL injection, um, when to use it, um, so I guess we, ha we already have, oh, staying safe, when to use it, um, maybe, uh, performance problems it solves, stuff like that, maybe that stuff, that sounds good. <coughs> so it's, it's, it, you know, it's funny how much the, the parameterization thing and the dynamic SQL thing, dynamic SQL thing come into, come into play together. Right, so let's actually make this a topic up here. Why didn't you do what I said to do? You're very mean to me, Microsoft Word. So maybe we'll take designing indexes out of there, and we'll keep what's a good index when there are too many. Well, we know it's about indexes now, so we don't have to keep that in there. So let's see here. Um, let's call this query anti patterns and what and the stuff that might fall into this. So it's interesting you say deadlocks, Lee, because are deadlocks a performance problem? Or are deadlocks a logic problem? Are deadlocks, uh, well, see, and we talked about this earlier. So locking and blocking, are they performance issues or are they concurrency issues? If I wanted to teach someone, if I wanted to do a day of concurrency, I would be all game to teach people about locking, blocking, and deadlocks. I would be all, I would be all about that. But I'd have a tough time covering the amount of ground that I'd want to cover 
with performance tuning and also getting to locking and deadlocks. <laughs> when it all goes crazy with triggers and foreign keys. So, you know, and that's, that's a funny one too, because with foreign keys in general, not always, but in general, as long as you have pretty good indexes to support your foreign keys, then you're in good shape. The trouble with triggers, the trouble with triggers is that people are going to do dumb things inside of triggers all the time. If I, if I were to tell, try to tell you about or try to show you the triggers I've seen in my life where people have written applications inside of triggers that run to account for like a decade of business logic when a single row gets inserted, not only would you not believe me, but we'd have a hard time like tuning that trigger. <laughs> People do some real bad things. CLR triggers. No, I, 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 don't, I don't do CLR much because I'm not smart enough to use C Sharp. So uh, CLR, CLR, well, it, it seems like a fine thing. And I've, I've bought books on C Sharp. I have them. I've started to read them. And you know what always happens? I start typing and I, 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 I fall over. <laughs> I fall over. Um, I just, you know what it is? I think it is, is that I have not had, um, I have not had a good reason to, or rather, I, I have not had a good application for CLR in SQL Server, uh, at least one that didn't already have a solution to it. So, like, uh, recently, my dear friend Josh helped me write a, um, a, a CLR utility to take all the numbers out of a string or all the string, all those like alphanumerics out of a string or something like that. And like, and he was very smart and good about that. He did it very quickly. If I were to try to do that, I would have beefed on that thing for days, probably come up with something that like didn't even compile. Maybe if it compiled, the results would be wrong. I just haven't had a good application for C. Um, is CLR so anything is a bad idea in in the right amount, right? I don't think C, there's anything necessarily wrong with CLR triggers. I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with some business logic in triggers. A lot of what a lot of what goes bad in a trigger is going to be what what goes bad inside of other user queries. Someone's going to write a bad query. Someone's not going to understand how to index to make the trigger go as fast as possible. Things like that. Like people are people are going to like you know write cursors inside triggers, use triggers to call store procedures. One of my very first consulting gigs was uh, working with a client who had terrible, terrible problems every time they inserted to a table. Really quickly, I, like, we, like, I was able to spot it because I was running SP Who is Active. Every time they inserted a row, a trigger would run that would call a report they would generate three different reports on every single like different on every, on like the same table three different ways. I was able to spot that quickly, but no one else looking at to everyone else was just like boom. So like if there's a if there's like a moral to this or it's like sure, don't put store procedures that call three different reports on a table inside of a trigger every time you insert a row. Is that a good performance tuning topic? I don't know. So I think you could take a lot of the performance tuning stuff and apply it to the bad idea stuff that people put inside of triggers. I just don't see how like targeting triggers is going to really help. Aaron Bertrand has a really good talk. I think it was at SQL Bits. Uh, Aaron Bertrand, SQL Bits, triggers. Where Aaron Bertrand uh, talks about some ways to write more effective triggers. I'm going to close that window before the video starts playing, but I'm going to stick the link into chat for you there. So Aaron Bertrand has a good has a good session on writing more effective triggers. But a lot of the stuff that's bad that people do inside of triggers is bad stuff that people do everywhere. You know, they'll they'll put the the entire content of the trigger inside of a transaction. They'll, you know, you know, call cursors and loops and iterate over things and, you know, and like won't understand how to tune the queries or the indexes on, that go inside the trigger. So I'm like, I'm like, I just don't think triggers are like that appealing of a subject overall. 
I would rather have people be able to learn as much as they can about query tuning and be able to apply it to things that they see inside of those triggers to make those triggers go faster. So when people want to apply 10 years of business logic, it happens as quickly as possible. So let's think about some other stuff. So we have stuff about query plans. We have stuff about query anti-patterns, some stuff that we can put in there off the top of our heads. It might be table variables, might be functions, might be sargability, might be implicit conversion. Um, what are some other things that we might see uh, in a, as, as a query anti-pattern? Spiritalize says, that's something you can put in a class, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean by that. Clarify and I will answer. CTEs. Yes. Well, CTEs, we know they're not magic. Uh, look at all that. CTEs. Um, let's see. What are some other things that we could stick in there? Wait stats. So we I talked about why I stay away from wait stats earlier. Um, you showed up a little late. I'm not going to talk about it all again, but wait stats are just not that interesting to me when it comes to tuning a single query. Um, wait stats are more of a server tuning thing. Bosco says nesting store procedures. Again, if you nest, nest store procedures, that's totally fine. There are actually very, very valid reasons to nest store procedures. Again, what I'd rather cover is, you know, rather than like um, something like that, I'd rather cover making the code inside of those nested store procedures as fast as possible so that people can tune those store procedures to go so fast that no one cares that they're nested, right? Like I, like I see what you're getting at, but, you know, nesting store procedures to me is a good choice sometimes. I've actually solved a lot of problems with that. See, Spiritalai says, I guess you do that already, similar to what you discussed about triggers, examples of the this is ugly, this is the bad, and then the good. Yeah, so, you know, sure, but, you know, again, um, the triggers are going to be T-SQL anyway, right? The, the, the triggers are going to have queries in them. The triggers are going to uh, need to be tuned in certain ways. So it doesn't matter that the code is in a trigger. What matters is people being able to, like, get the query plan, look at the text of the trigger, see what indexes were involved, and then start to solve problems from there. But learning by example is huge to me, right? Because if people, if, if, like learning by example is, I think, the best way to learn, right? If, like, if, like, if, if, if it's just a bunch of theory, then people, people, people leave kind of empty-handed if it's just all theory. People don't have concrete examples of when things are bad, how to know that they're bad, how to fix them, stuff like that, then like, what do people really walk away with? More guesses, right? More, more things that they're not sure about, right? If you give them, if you give them a, a steps to solve a problem, that's a, that's a powerful, powerful thing. Teach them how to fish, as they say, right? Teach them how to fish. All right, so let's see. What are some other query anti-patterns that we can maybe put in there? Let's see. Curious. Curious what else we could maybe put inside of there. Ooh, you know what's a good one? I can't believe I didn't think about that. Local variables. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good list. So when we say identifying bottlenecks, maybe we should put identifying bottlenecks up under reading query plans because that's probably where we're going to identify the bottleneck. That's like the most reasonable place to identify a bottleneck is looking in the query plan. If you just look at a query, it might be pretty hard to figure out what in the query is causing the bottleneck. One of the biggest, one of my biggest pet peeves, if I'm looking at any Q&A site, is someone posts just the text of a query and they're like, I need to tune this. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what would you like to do with it? What's slow about it, right? Like, so like if we're going to identify a bottleneck, we're probably going to need some deeper information. That deeper information is probably going to be stuff that we find in the query plan. So <clears throat> reading query plans, let's take the question mark out of there. We're going to be identifying bottlenecks. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Galbo says, put UI logic in query. Ouch! That is no good. Um, so one crazy thing that I saw recently was uh, someone uh, had a table with a um, a binary column in it and that binary column could be converted to XML and the XML contained the entirety 
of each individual user's user settings, application logic, things that they had customized about their application. And every time someone logged in, they had to go through this table, convert their row from var binary to XML, and then search the XML for different things. It was one of the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. It was like, like just like, what were those? What what happened with your developers that they did that? The worst part is that they 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 fancied themselves to be X query experts, but they were casting their XML to Envarcar and just searching things as it as like a SQL blob. And I was just like, oh, bless your little hearts, bless your little hearts. So uh, I, let's see, reading query plans, identifying bottlenecks, query anti-patterns like table variables, functions, targetability, implicit versus CDs, local variables, parallelism. All right, so. Coyote McD, if you are still here, what about parallelism would you want your one or two year into SQL self to learn? Let's see, good tables and normalization. So good tables and normalization is certainly um, a, a performance topic. It's very hard to get people to make changes to table structure. There are... There have been many, 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 many times in my consulting career when I've tried to tell people, well, look, it's going to be really hard for you to, uh, to get the kind of performance you want unless you normalize stuff out. Like this one big wide table you have is giving you a really hard time. Within that table, we have a bunch of groups of columns that would actually, they're actually sort of identify themselves as tables like you might have columns with a bunch of prefixes like client name client address client phone and you might have a bunch of um of uh columns that identify themselves as um like things that just sort of belong together like phone one phone two phone three phone four phone five things like that like you might have those sort of self-identifying tables with inside like inside of your tables and that's that's an okay thing to tell people about but that's a hard thing to get people to change. It might help them the next time they start a project from scratch, but it's really hard for them to get to change their application or change their like table design and then change their application to work with the table design. Even if you give them hints like, well, you know, you could change this and then use like a view that has like the join in it to sort of do things. It's it's not it's not an easy undertaking. There are a lot of gutches in there. So good t- good tables and normalization, sure, but I have about five minutes worth of things to say about that, and you just heard it. Uh, let's see. Uh, what's going on here? Why repartition streams in there, and why ordering is bad with parallelism? So Coyote McD, that's stuff that you would want yourself to know after one or two years of learning about SQL Server performance. That's that's a tough couple things for people. Like Like if I started talking about... Uh, like exchange spills or parallel, like uh, inter-query parallel deadlocks to people who have been working with SQL Server for a year or two, I think that I don't think that they would be able to make heads or tails of it. It would be like a scare quote, right? It would be like one of those old movies about pot where someone jumps out a window. <laughs> like, and, and, and the other thing is if I tell them about that, you know what they're going to do? They're going to hate parallelism forever. They're not going to trust parallel queries. Every time they see a parallel query, they're going to be like, oh, God, is it doing that thing that guy told me about that one time? Is it spilling? What's going on? <laughs> Maybe I was a little advanced at one to two years. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're, a, you're, a, smart, you're a smart fella, you've, and, you've, and you've hung around smart fellas, and you've invested the amount of time that would, that would certainly get you um, past where most people would be. Um, uh, but I think... It would be tough, tough to sell that to someone starting out. So Khalil Jamil says compression. Sure. So what about compression? We have row compression and we have page compression. What kind of stuff would you want to learn about it? So let's see. Uh, let's take these out for now. Or let, you know, let's move these a little bit because we have some questions about these. And figure these things out. Go Vax, UN, and we'll add compression to the list. And so what about compression would be interesting to you? For anyone else, for anyone else out there who, 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 like, what sort of one, if you have any ideas about, like, what your one to two year into SQL Server self would be into, 
about parallelism, resource usage by queries or compression, sh throw it into chat. We can, we can try to figure this out together. Try to figure out what kind of stuff you might be interested in. This is all stuff I'm game to go into. It's just I want to make sure that I'm, I'm going down the right path for what people, for what would, what would really bake people's noodles. What would get you going? What would make you happy to see be taught? All right, got kind of quiet there. <laughs> All right, so I think we have a pretty good list of topics, right? So what's their pain? All of these things. Um, it's a challenge knowing what you don't know. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a challenge knowing what you don't know, but it's 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 also a challenge t trying to teach you what you need to know. Um, you know, you you know, like just maybe the thing that you need to know about parallelism is whether it's good or bad. If, you, if it's something you should worry about, like what it is, what it does, you know, like, or maybe what you need to know about resource usage by queries is just like, like, um, like, is that, is, is that something that you should be concerned about? Is like, do, 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 will, will queries that use more resources go slower? For compression, it's just what, like, what kind of compression should I use? I mean, that's pretty well documented. There aren't a ton of gutches with compression. I sort of like compression. I just don't see it get used a lot. The other thing about compression is it just hasn't changed much since like SQL Server 2008R2 or so. So like, you know, it's, it's another one where like, if I'm going to teach it, I need something very specific to teach people about. You know, like, like really it's, it's sort of a, it's like a five minute statement in a lot of ways. It's like compression. It's good because this. You should use row compression when you have fairly unique data. You should use page compression when you have less unique data. Right? It's just like you know, like, like stuff that you can just get out of the way pretty quickly. It might not demo well, and it might not be anything that people need to know about. Uh, Ken McTee says the very basics of what the optimizer does. So, hmm, okay. So let's uh, see. Let's see. Let's go back to here. The basics of what the optimizer does. He says, I would have liked something about how to measure changes you make in a better way than just watching the timer at the bottom right of SSMS. So would that go under resource usage and how to measure changes? Uh, yeah, there we go. So parallelism. Uh, so let's just call that uh, how to set settings. That might be a good one. That might be uh, that might be close enough, and we'll. We, we know what the settings are. We don't have to worry about that. We know we're not talking about resource governor. Kendra didn't show up because apparently I'm not talking about resource governor. So Kendra didn't show. It's very hurt by that. I'm kidding. I think it's just Kendra's probably just drunk on a couch somewhere. <laughs> I don't blame Kendra. It is that time. It is that time when you're in the UK. It is that time. Okay, so the basics of what the optimizer does. So let's just call that the basics of the optimizer. So Coyote McD, it's a, it's a good suggestion, but I want to ask you, what are optimizer basics? If you, if you had to think about optimizer basics, would it be, um, you know, uh, optimizer assumptions like the cold cache uh, that the data exists that data is independent stuff like that uh, would it be um, you know figuring out query plans or like like maybe optimizer tricks like uh, like simplification or you know um, contradiction detection or stuff like that uh, coll collapsing subqueries or expressions like what kind of what kind of optimizer, ba or what would you consider to be basics of the optimizer? That would be, or maybe like uh, the optimizer has rules, stuff like that. Uh, query plan reuse. So query plan reuse, I would put that up under parameterization. 
Uh, so I would put that up here and plan reuse. So that would be a good topic under parameterization because that is that is very that is very very good and that definitely falls into like a pretty big wheelhouse of of subjects and topics that you can talk about with people that will like boggle <laughs> and make them angry and be like, why does it do that? <laughs> Like, who designed this thing? What are they so great? Like, what are they thinking? So yeah, that's definitely a good one that we can um, we can put in there. I would add that in there. Uh, has something about statistics been put down yet? No, nothing about statistics. Um, but what about statistics? What's something about statistics would you want to learn? How to look at them? Uh, how to figure out if they're good or bad. You know, there's like the ascending key problem that got that got kind of fixed with SQL Server with the new cardinality estimator. Um, say kind of fixed. But like, what about like like old statistics, when to update statistics? Because if we're talking about when to up update statistics, that's a maintenance thing. <laughs> oh, so it's off, but I never grasped the service broker, how to use it. Why would be better than the cat? Yeah, it's service broker is... I mean, <sighs> Remus Rasanu is one of the finest people you may never meet in your life. I, I still don't know why why Service Broker came in, came to be. Um, my old my old coworker Jeremiah once used Service Broker to asynchronously shrink transaction logs. People often have to hunt for reasons to use Service Broker. Michael Erickson says, I guess it is hard to understand parameter sniffing without basic statistics knowledge. So that's a that's an interesting one. And that would kind of tie into what happens with uh, stats and local variables. Uh, maybe this would also have something about stats in it. Um, Sargability would certainly have something about stats in it and so would implicit conversion. There would definitely be stuff about stats in there. And then parameterization, this would certainly have stuff about stats in it because you you know when you when you're learning about <clears throat> uh, when you're learning about you know why SQL Server chooses different plans, then statistics are a big part of that. So Lee says, let me rephrase that estimations and how to troubleshoot when they are out by a lot. Uh, you mean aside from updating statistics? So there's a, there's a lot that goes into that. So when when sti so when cardinality estimates are terribly wrong, you know you have to go back and you kind of have to look at is it one of these problems? Did I not update statistics recently, um, or did I write my predicate or my join in a way that SQL Server is unable to make a good guess? The other thing that's a big the other thing that's big there is figuring out when. Uh, when inaccurate statistics guesses are actually a problem. I see questions posted quite a bit about statistics were right, but everything else was wrong. Or statistics were wrong, but like, and I have the, here's my query plan, how do I fix it? But the plan is still remarkably fast. So uh, I think when it comes to statistics in general, rather than have a section on statistics, I would rather weave statistics in to a lot of the different things I teach, because you can you can you can you can really I think you can you can drive home how important statistics can be when they're like when they cause problems and when they don't. So I would probably want to weave that in. Uh, Kevin McTee says maybe something about the optimize forehand. All right, so would I put that under? You know what? I would I would want to have that under local variables. Since optimize for does just about the same thing there, so I would have optimize for alongside local variables. So we'll optimize for unknown, right? So let's make sure that's specific. The optimize for unknown would be would certainly fall into the local variable category. I don't, but uh, you know that's something that I would want to be tie into there, because I don't want people to walk away from this with a question like, "But what's the difference between you know optimize for unknown and a local variable?" And the same reason that you know you see the question all the time, people asking, you know, like, uh, "What's the difference between no lock and read?" Uncommitted, right? Like that. <laughs> What's the difference between no? Same thing. 
<laughs> the difference between local variables and optimized for unknown. It's the same damn thing. He says, I guess transactions would fall under concurrency. So when you're talking about transactions, when you're talking about begin, begin tran and commit or roll back, everything that happens within that is subject to query tuning, right? And we know they're dangerous because they increase the chance of blocking. If you update, if you like say begin tran, update a single row, then go do like go off on some crazy meandering path of doing things and then finally roll back or commit way down here. Well, if all of this big meandering path is fast, then that then that one lock you took up here that was done say 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds later, probably not the end of the world. But if you take that one update and then this big meandering path is like two to five seconds, then that lock becomes more interesting. So when it comes to tuning transactions, tuning transactions is more about tuning everything that happens within the transaction. Same thing with triggers, right? Same thing with functions, same thing with store procedures, same thing with anything that contains code in SQL Server. If you have, the, if you have a whole bunch of stuff that's slow between a begin tran and a commit or roll back, we can focus on tuning the stuff that's slow in there. You know, sure, there's, there, there might be times when you can move the begin tran to like some other part of the code where it really matters, but otherwise, what do you tune about a transaction? You tune the underlying queries and indexes, right? You don't go and you don't, you don't, there's like no like, like hint and there's no like option for begin tran that makes things faster, right? <coughs> but yeah, transactions generally would, fall, would be a concurrency thing. Not that concurrency has nothing to do with performance. It's just that concurrency is such a topic unto itself with locking, blocking, deadlocks, transactions, things like that, that it's really tough to sort of, um, uh, you know, like stick into a performance tuning talk easily. So we have a good list of things here. Right? We, have, we have a few different titles up here. And that's, that's good. That's good stuff. So let's start on this page. Let's start on this page. And let's say, what is our abstract going to be? So let's, do, let's not say you're a DBA or developer. Let's, let's take titles out of it, right? And let's say something like, you're new to SQL Server and your job is to let's say uh, fix performance problems but you don't know where to start you've been looking at queries and query plans and um, let's see uh, mm. uh, queries, query plans, and let's just say something. We'll we'll fill that in later. And something indexes uh, for a year or two, but it's still not making a lot of sense. Logs you read give very nice. Ah, nice. Oh, stop it! Or if it applies to you, uh, <laughs> use UUID as a primary key. I'm totally fine with that. Uh, I'm just happy if you have a primary key. I'm happy if you have tried so hard to design things properly that you have a GUID as a primary key. There are ways to f like not have it be so painful, like if you make your primary key a non-clustered index or if you use uh, like a sequentially generated GUID, you can have far fewer problems with GUIDs as a primary key. But most of the time when I see someone has a primary key, I'm like, hey, you know what? You tried your best. You tried, you tried hard. And I understand why. You know what, you know, I, when you think about numbers, in SQL Server. You think about ints and big ints. What do they have that GUIDs don't have? They have an end. There's a, there's a finite number of those numbers until you have reached the end 
of those numbers. GUIDs, wide open, baby. You can have GUIDs go on forever and probably be unique. Numbers, finite. Even if you start negative and go positive, they are still finite. Granted, big ints take a long time to go from the negative end to the positive end <laughs> and, hit, and hit both sides of that limit. But I, ha I have faith that with big enough data, with real big data, you could do it. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to take a quick break, and I will be back, and uh, we will work more. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, even in a pandemic, you know what people don't do? Just leave things when they read the doorbell. <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> it's like everything I do, I'm like contactless delivery, contactless delivery, contact. Please, please just leave it. <laughs> what happens? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you know I'm home. You know I'm home. Where else am I going to be? Just leave it. It's fine. 
All right, so let's finish up. Let's finish up strong. We'll we'll go we'll go until I don't know the hour, and we'll we'll finish up writing this abstract here. Uh, the blogs you read get very specific advice, and you're not sure if it applies to you, or it's even the problem. So using some of uh, Lee's advice, um, beyond beyond that, you're not even sure how to. Well, you know what we said even there. How to measure if your changes are, well, let's say, are working. Cool. So we got that part. And we'll say something like, uh, you know, like in this day long, right? So let's see, join me for a full day, right? And so it is going to be a full day, right? Well, you know what? I don't like the way that sounds. Uh, you know what I don't like about that? It starts with join. <sighs> you know what bums me out about join? It's too punny. It's too punny for me. Much like LaCroix bubbles are too big and soft for me. <coughs> and only Canada dry bubbles satisfy me. Things that are too punny don't go over well with me. So, in this full day, uh, I don't know. Let's just let's let's just say something funny in here. Performance tuning extravaganza. <coughs> You'll learn all of the stuff. I'll get to that in a second. Okay. You'll learn about <coughs> all the most common anti-patterns in T C Ooh, oh I messed that up terribly. T SQL querying and indexing. How to spot them uh, using oh come on, I was so close. Using execution plans. Ah here we go. All right. That's a full enough thought. In this full day performance tuning extravaganza, you'll learn about all the most common anti-patterns in T-SQL querying and indexing and how to spot them using execution plans. You'll also leave knowing V. Let's see here. What could we call some of these things? Knowing why. Why they cause the problems that they do and how you can solve them quickly and painlessly. <coughs> Pain points. Pain points, indeed. So I don't like to say pain points too much because I don't want, I don't want people. <clears throat> I want people to, to to come to me knowing that they have them without me having to point them out over <laughs> again. Like, ooh, that looks like it hurts. Ooh, that looks like it hurts. Ooh, how do you do that? So uh, let's see here. Let's see here. So we could add in some specific stuff now, right? So you'll learn, uh, let's see, when, which temporary object to, actually, no, let's start, let's, we'll get to that in a minute. You'll learn how to write queries that will never be slow. Uh, I mean, that sounds good. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's totally true. You'll learn how to write queries. Uh, you know what? Screw it. We're gonna stick with that. They'll never be slow. Uh, we have a lot of you'll learn in here. You know, there's a lot of you'll learns. We have a lot of you have too many you'll learns. Do we have how many do we have? Not that many. It is a bold statement, but I'm a bold human being. <laughs> I'm like barbecue saucily. Bold. 
and tangy. All right, that's all I got. <laughs> I'm not bald. I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Uh, so let's see. Let's read the little Unit of SQL Server, and your job is to fix performance problems. Ooh, you know what we should do here? Your job more and more is to fix performance problems, but you don't know where to start. You've been looking at queries and query plans and puzzling over indexes for a year or two, but it's still not making a lot of sense. The blogs you read give very specific advice, and you're not sure if it applies to you or if it's a problem. No, I don't like this one. I don't like that one. Beyond that, you're not even sure how to measure if your changes are working or even the right thing to do. There we go. That can be a big assumption. <clears throat> um, but the nice thing there, the nice thing there is if they leave with the materials, they have no excuse not to learn it eventually. Even if they don't learn it that day, they'll bring it home and they'll learn it eventually. <laughs> so it's bold. So you'll learn is like future predictive. You'll learn at some point in the future. Might not be today, might not be tomorrow, but at some point you will open up that thing that I gave you and you'll say, ah. Oh, and you'll have learned it. So you will learn. You'll learn. It's not like saying, you'll pay. I would even say if they have <laughs> the concept that they have no excuse to learn. Yeah, you know, I just like don't, I just don't want to put that kind of thing on people like, like, look, you have no excuse. <laughs> Sounds like, like my, my mother vacuuming outside my door when I had a hangover when I was a kid. <laughs> you have no excuse. <laughs> Oh, not for the doc. Yes, not for the doc indeed. So let's see here. Pretty happy with this. You've been looking at queries, queries up in the plenary of the year to have something on a sense. Beyond that, you're not even sure how to measure if your chains are working. Sorry, my printer just started spazzing out for some reason. <laughs> in this full day, performance tuning extravaganza, ganza, 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 you'll learn about all the most common anti-patterns in T-SQL querying and indexing and how to spot them using execution plans. No, we'll keep that all together. You also leave knowing why they cause the problems that they do and how you can solve them quickly and painlessly. Uh, if you want to the knowledge and confidence to tune queries so they'll never be slow again. This is <laughs> if anyone <laughs> who's thinking about attending watches this video and sees all the typos I'm making, they might change their mind. <laughs> I found the main barrier for me is not being able to learn about something is my laziness. No excuse other than that. Well, Lee, uh, I, I, I understand that fully. If you want to gain the knowledge and confidence to tune queries, I'll never be slow again. This is the the what. This is the training you need. So let's go back and let's see here. Let's see. Training you need. All these in one day. So, no. I, I, asked, I asked the attendees for their ideas. There's a lot of this stuff that you can, you can cover in a day. I would probably cut the line about here. Because I think a lot of... So, uh, it's a good, that's a good question, Paranoid DBA. And... If you think about what's being talked about here as like, um, come on, man, come on back. Where do you go? Why are you not? 
whatever, screw this. So if you think about teaching each one of these concepts individually, yes, that is a big, crazy, wide open day of learning, right? You can think about it like that. But if you tie these all in together, if you tie these things in together so that when they, they learn about sargability, they also learn about implicit conversion, and like you can, you can tie a lot of these subjects in so that you, you kind of put, you put more of these pieces together into a puzzle. Spirit of Life says, the Friday session had a lot of these topics minus, lo minus blocking. Um, yeah, so yes, but uh, this would be like beginner stuff. So this would be like very like early on entry level stuff. When you're when you're like as, as you progress through performance tuning, the first thing you have to learn is like you have to learn the fundamentals of these things, and then as you get more advanced, you can you can you you can like you know you get more you get as you get more advanced, you can apply them to more advanced things. So what I've found over the course of my life performance tuning is that a lot of the reasons why queries are slow hasn't changed a lot. But there are different audiences. And those different audiences have different strengths, different weaknesses. And someone just walking into query tuning who needs to know like just the right thing to do, they might not they might not need to know like lots of super advanced things that you can do with these things, but they need to know what the right thing to do is. Right? They need that basic fundamental knowledge of like, why do table variables give me a weird plan? Right? What is sargability? Well, stuff like that. Are CTEs better than temp tables? Um, why? Like, how come when I use a local variable, this execution plan gets weird on me? You know, like if I have a query that's going slow, how do I know if it has a good index? Things like that. The more advanced stuff is just like the next stage of like you already understand what an implicit conversion is we don't need to talk about that um you know what you need to know is like uh you know you're looking at an execution plan and it has a spool in it and you need to know why that spool is there and how you can fix that spool so you've gotten to the point where you kind of know this basic stuff but getting to the next point Paranoid DUSA says, but that changes in each version of SQL. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it sort of changed for some things in SQL Server 2019. And it didn't even change in a complete and like overwhelmingly good way. It does not change in each version of SQL. Implicit conversion has been the same. CTEs have been the same. The problems with local variables have been the same. The problem with sargability have been the same. The problem with functions have been the same. The problem, all of these problems have been the same with only a few changes in SQL Server 2019. And if, you can, and if you think that there are a lot of people who are one to two years into their SQL Server journey who are gonna be coming to training, let's say in the next two to three, maybe six months, who are all full, fully fledged using SQL Server 2019 in production, you are out of your mind. But no, not, most of these things have not changed with every version of SQL Server. What's a good index has not changed. Parameterization has not changed. Uh, parameter sniffing has not changed. How to use dynamic SQL properly has not changed. None of these things have changed with the SQL Server. Lee still has SQL Server 2008 instances. Lee, no wonder you want a different job. <laughs> I hope that works out soon for you. So let's see here. Let's finish this up and let's get on out of here. It's been it's been a while. Me babbling on and on to you. If you want to gain the knowledge and confidence to tune queries so they'll never be slow again, this is the training you need. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if I want to add anything to this. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna save this. This PC. I'm gonna save this. And I, oh, I'll save this later. What I'm gonna do is save this and I'm gonna sleep on it. Free candy at the end. How about, um, and you also get access to all my videos. Blah, blah, blah. Bing! I'm not giving away my Canada Dry Lee. Canada Dry is my favorite seltzer. 
it's much better than LaCroix. Canada Dry is the best seltzer. Never going to give away my Canada Dry. You can't take my Canada Dry, Lee. Don't try to. <laughs> All right. So um, I think we've done a pretty good job of getting uh, getting the what we want to teach, who we want to teach it to in the abstract in there. Uh, I should tweet that. Uh, I'm too lazy to tweet that. Uh, any vodka with it? No, not today. Not yet, at least. Uh, it's still, um, you know, it's still three o'clock here and, uh, I don't know. I wanted, I wanted to at least get through this thing sober right after this. Right at this. Botsko, sure. Let me point you to my website where there is yet another post about local variables. Yeah. Well, that's a bad idea, isn't it? Michael says, I think this would be good for devs that need to write queries right from the beginning. Yes, that is, that is absolutely what I'm going for here. Um, so I want people who... So like, so expanding a little bit on what Michael said, because Michael brings up an excellent point. What I, want, what, I, what I would say about training like this is that when you have had a T-SQL application that's been around for a while, you most likely have a lot of bad practices in there. SQL Server developers will show up to either, it's going to be their first day on the job as a T-SQL developer, they're not going to really be a T-SQL developer, they're going to be a developer in some other, um, something else, and you know they're going to see what you did in that code that's bad, and what's going to happen is they're going to just keep, keep doing that. They're going to keep repeating the same mistakes. They're going to take those mistakes with them elsewhere. And what I want to do is get people to the point where um, what when they're writing a query, they're not making those fundamental unforced errors. They're not continuing on that, that legacy of, of poor T-SQL hygiene. So what Michael said is very, very on point with what I want to do. I want to give people the right foundational knowledge so that, you know, they don't get bit by a lot of just the, you know, those like, like head, like why performance issues, right? That's what I want. That's what I want. So, uh, thank you for hanging out with me today while we, while we talked about what makes a good abstract and writing the abstract. Also, thank you very much for your ideas and suggestions. I appreciate it. It's nice having people to brainstorm with. Um, if you would like to join me Friday 10th or 24th, uh, I have a full day of online performance tuning. The coupon code floating above my head will get you 75 bucks off uh, from there. Uh, if you want to get tickets, you can head over here. And if you buy a ticket, you get free access to all of my training forever and ever. You can look at what my training covers over at that link. So uh, feel free to click on those at your leisure. Um, if you if this is the kind of SQL Server content that you enjoy watching, uh, you know you can hit the little bell buttons on YouTube to like, or subscribe, or whatever the whatever you cool kids do these days. Same thing for Twitch. If you want to follow me on Twitch, you'll get notified when I go live. You won't have to depend on uh, Twitter to tell you because we all know how untrustworthy Twitter is. So. Thanks for joining me. Uh, come on back. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to be doing one tomorrow because it's Saturday, and uh, <laughs> I'll probably end up. I'll, I'll probably not be in good shape <laughs> for doing a live stream. Plus, I think I'm about to get arrested anyway. So, thanks for joining me. Um, if I can get through one live stream without sirens, I would be so impressed. Thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for hanging out, and I will most likely uh, see you uh, next week for some more live streaming goodness. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. See you next time.